good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming uh, today. Uh, we are thrilled and delighted to have with us uh, Professor Carlos Bosch from uh, Princeton University, uh, the Department of Politics and the uh, Woodrow Wilson School of Public Affairs. Uh, Professor Bosch is a, uh, a brilliant political scientist whose work explores really the relationship um, between democracy and development. And one of his most uh, influential works, uh, he explores this relationship that we've thought about since Seymour Martin Lipset in the 1950s, that d development tends to lead unproblematically uh, to democracy. And Professor Bosch's work really took this relationship and unpacked it, first defending it against people who said that the relationship didn't really exist, but then unpacking it, arguing that it's actually income, in equ income equality and factor mobility, both of which are products of development, that make democracy more likely, mainly by reducing the elite's fear that it's going to be egregiously expropriated uh, uh, through taxation uh, in a democracy. Um, Professor Bosch is an extraordinarily wide-ranging scholar, so in addition to his work on democracy and distribution, he currently has a project on the dynamics of authoritarian rule, and as someone who studies this uh, for a living, I will say that reading his work, which I, I hope will soon be published, is sort of like opening a, a window in a dark room. Um, he's also got a project that I've, I've been following for many years with uh, my dissertation advisor, uh, uh, employing archaeological data on uh, bone length. Uh, in ancient societies to say something about uh, inequality in those societies. And so it's no surprise that a scholar of this creativity and depth has won, I think is the only human being to win the William Riker Award twice, um, and several other uh, awards uh, from the American Political Science Association. The work that Professor Bush is going to present to us today is a new project that relies, I, I think, on uh, some agent-based modeling uh, techniques. No, no agent-based modeling in this program? Uh, but it does shed light on how uh, state formation uh, and different patterns of state formation result in different patterns of, of development and wealth distribution, and he will certainly explain it far better than I will. So with that, I turn it over to Professor Bosch. Thank you so much. You're very, very kind. Um, no, uh, no, in fact, I'm going to talk about bones. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, 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 but at the end. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. So basically, you know, the, the uh, well, thank you for inviting me to this place. I hope it's uh, interesting to you. Um, basically, the main project I'm, I'm working on, and uh, it is related to this question of uh, democracy and inequality, because I, you know, I, I um, you know, I have been asked about the, the where this does this inequality come from. And so I didn't dare do anything about this until Margaret Levy asked me to write a uh, review article for the annual review of science, and then I jumped into this. And as a result of that, I, I, you know, I was pushed to write this paper. Um, and so, so basically, the paper. Uh, this is not the review for the. You know, this is not the review paper, but something uh, a bit deeper. And the review it tries to do two things. Basically, one is to talk, to think about how states got formed, how societies went from being state to societies, um, to or, you know, think of um, the anthropological pr primitive societies, the Anomamo, the uh, Hatsa, the whatever, uh, and then go into having some kind of political institutions that I will very. Um, uh, it's in a stylized way I will talk about as monarchical or republican. That's one of the goals of the paper. The second one is to explore at the same time the causes of wealth um, and income inequality, especially in this paper I'm going to present in the transition from agrarian and stateless societies to uh, societies with institutions. Basically, uh, for the review paper I was talking about, I start with this, uh, I think, uh, set of facts that in primitive economies, at some point, um, the, those that existed, but still for those that are there and have been the subject of anthropological studies, what we observe is relatively equal distributions of income. Uh, there are other types of um, inequalities, for example, um, um, and things related to polygamous practices and so on. Um, then we see growing inequalities coming with the agrarian revolution that coincides with the state formation. Uh, 
but within that jump, we see some kind of variation in inequality across human societies and over time. And then finally, um, there has been a decline in inequality uh, since 1850 with industrial revolution. I'm not going to talk about this last one. Um, the existing literature on state formation, I would say it's an immense. Um, there are two types of things that is of interest to me uh, for the paper. Uh, for the paper someone who may have written here about this and I'm not using uh, his or her word, but uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Uh, so, um, the first is that the state identified as a stationary bandit, as a rugged bandit that becomes a stationary bandit and imposes peace and protects individuals in exchange for some kind of payment. That's the also in the North story. That's the most analytical story I think we have. And then we have uh, a lot of historical sociology on how um, uh, military technology and war made the state and made different types of state institutions mostly uh, applied to European history, but there has been some work on China, on, on China and the formation of the Chinese Empire, so tedious with many other hints that many, many come to mind when we talk about this. Uh, on income inequality, when I reviewed the literature, what I found was basically mostly the political economy on the consequences of inequality, consequences on political conflict, the consequences on transitions to democracy, consequences on electoral outcomes and most recently on welfare states. And then certainly a research on the causes of inequality, but most of this research has been focused on industrialization uh, and especially on the fact that there has been increasing wage dispersion in some ways in the country since the 1970s. This is uh, one of the sort of most debated and researched topics uh, uh, why is that the US, for example, has become so unequal in the last 30, 40 years. And then substantively, so theoretically, most of the things I found were about economic parameters uh, or based on some economic theory about technological shocks and perfect credit markets. So, uh, and then all these uh, stories, so not much about uh, inequality at the time of the formation of the state and not very clear uh, discussions about what is or what was the relationship between the formation of the state and income on the, and the emergence of income inequality. So what I want to do basically is to present some kind of uh, theory, uh, I hope, uh, you know, kind of a stylized model, and then some empirics that will include some uh, bone uh, bone data uh, because I think it's the best. It, it, it's pretty bad that uh, you know the best data I have found. Um, welfare distribution. And so for the theory, basically what I'm going to say is that um, at one point uh, there were those societies that were more or less equal. I will try to show that in that equality was precisely what made possible, what made spontaneous cooperation possible without institutions. Then there were some shocks, some technological shocks that I'll try to show that were exogenous, uh, that led to uh, income inequality, so the productivities of populations differed, and that triggered systematic political conflict, uh, which then led to the emergence of the state, uh, in most cases. Okay. And the type of the state that appeared was determined by mostly military and organizational factors, so the kinds of uh, weapons that were used, and I'll try to, and that's where I I'm still working on this, but different types of weapons, as McNeil in the uh, pursuit of power already kind of points out, lead to different types of estates. And it's the interaction of the income shocks that are basically random in a way, um, and the political response that explains, I think, may be a way of thinking about uh, income distributions. Uh, and after that, I'll do some empirics. Uh, I'll talk about how biographical conditions explain the emergence of our culture and also the emergence of the state across the world. And then I'll do some uh, work. I will show some work on bones. Uh, I'm with uh, Professor uh, with Francis Rosenbluth at Yale, 
uh, we have this paper where we decided that we were too bored um, in one of these APSA meetings, and so we started talking and said, you know, we do not have very good data on uh, on distributions of income before in 1950, for that matter. But um, but economists have been using height and other wealth, uh, other uh, measures of uh, uh, you know, health and so on, to look at. Um, evolution of standards of living and income. So we said, why don't we look at, at heights as a way of thinking about distribution of, of income, since at least for pre-industrial societies, a lot of people live at the margin uh, subsistence, right? And so many of them went through processes of stunting and so on. I mean, just those that have followed this news about the common, uh, he was the pharaoh, I mean, it's not a very good example, really, but you know, he was, he had a club foot and a cleft palate and he had malaria and everything. I mean, and so, but we use this to see if um, there were differences in certain societies and the differences tell us something about. In fact, you know, we did this first and then I, we, I we stopped or I basically said to Francis, I don't want to work on this anymore because I'm not sure I can make anything, up, take any, you know, kind of extract anything from this. And now that I have this other thing, I think they can be perhaps together. So, um, there is, uh, you know, let me go through these. Um, uh, basically, in the model, what I'm trying to suggest is to think about a world where it has individuals. We can think of this as two types of individuals, or even two types of groups, I and J. Um, there is no state, so no one has the monopoly of coercion. That's my definition of the state. And these individuals have the same amount of time, L. And uh, they, to uh, maximize income, they can do two things. They can either alloc they can do some productive activity, so they can allocate uh, some fraction of their time, uh, one minus lambda of this time L, to a productive activity. They generate some income given uh, some technology they have of production, and then some fixed stock of land. So I'm not going to change the land that they have. Um, but they can also use their time to extrapolate others, right? So they can predate on others. And how much they will predate is going to depend on some parameter, uh, zeta L, which is basically telling us how efficient they are in grabbing things from others, right? So you can either, if you're a primitive person, you can either go and pick strawberries directly, or you can wait for the other one to pick the strawberry for you and then before the you know the time that he's trying to put the strawberry in the mouth just are very fast um, and we take this thing. Okay? So that's uh, and okay. So to make this uh, simple, uh, you know, it looks not simple but it's very simple really. Um, let's assume that L, the time they have to do these types of activities, is the same for all of them and that the T, the fixed land, is also this uh, is also the same. And so we can define then uh, the A hat sub n as the uh, production function of individual n over the individual j, okay? And this is going to give us basically, for individual i, is going to give us A hat i. It's going to be the ratio of the technology of i over the technology of j. Remember there, there are two individuals, i and j. And then j over j is one, right? So I'm going to compress everything in these individuals in terms of this parameter a that is telling us the uh, equality in the technology of production they have. That's the only thing I'm doing here. It's going to be, you know, uh, and these of course can vary. It can be one because all of them have the same a, or it can be infinity very hard, okay? Uh, and so individual i uh, uh, is going to get, in terms of returns, some uh, 1 minus lambda, so the time that he spends in production, a plus uh, the time of expropriation times the efficiency parameter times 1, which is the, uh, the uh, output of the uh, j individual, right? And as I said, this, this is a game uh, where you have 
uh, two agents. They, as I said, they can either produce or loot the other. And this would be, I, you know, perhaps a bit uh, arbitrary, if you will. But uh, the, so if the two produce, say that the two, for reasons I'll develop in a bit, the two of them produce, then no one loots. H and I spends all his time producing. Producing, he gets A. Agent J spends all her time producing this one. Okay. Uh, if uh, J produces, then an agent I loads, I get the time he is spending producing times A hat, uh, and then the time of devoted to expropriation times the technology, the, sorry, the the booting. Uh, parameter times one, which is the production of J. Okay, the same thing for J, but the other way around. Uh, if uh, H and I uh, loots and J produces, let's say that J would get one minus lambda, so the time, the, the the period of time devoted to production, multiplied by some parameter that reduces that because there is some impact due to. Uh, to uh, you know the, the attack of the other, and finally, if both of them loot, the only thing that they get is what they directly produce. So let's. I am assuming here that everything disappears that uh, that is not has not been produced, and is this thing about the strawberries the only one I pick? I get into my mouth. That's what I get. Now, given these, when are they going to uh, coordinate on production or somewhere else? Right. Um, and basically, um, this is going to allow us to think about what are the moments at which you can have some what I call non-institutional, non-institutionalized cooperation. Right? Basically, when is the time where the two of them, without any of the two being having the monopoly of coercion or a third party coming and coordinating them, force them to be in the production production. Uh, Equilibrium, right? Um, so assume that the two of them are um, um, basically interacting over time, so there is some, some iteration. They apply some discount rate um, because they you know, value a bit less the future. And let's think of this as simply a game with a trigger strategy where either you, both of them, so one starts with P and the other responds producing, they all. Uh, keep producing, but if one of them moves to looting, they move to looting all of them and keep playing looting all the time. Right? So, uh, and we are interested in seeing at what time are the two going to go for P. Right? So let's think about player I. Player I is going to choose uh, a production strategy if producing all the time, so A uh, uh, discounted by some discount rate this future, um, this is better than basically producing some and looting in the first period, and no, then knowing that after that, everything is going to be about looting all the time. Okay. Why do you assume that sort of prisoner's dilemma like um, defect, defect? Why do you, in other words, let's take ancient Greece where um, Athens was the predator to the other island. Um, if the other islands can't get an army that will um, that can stand up against yeah. Athens, then it would pay them to keep producing because trying to loop backwards yes. would be ineffectual. Yes. So they would just produce, and it would be to Athens' um, interests to mm -hmm. act as a single, you know, a stationary um, robber baron, yes. and and all and take continue to let them yes. live and yes. produce yes. and just take their yes. surplus. Yes. So better than they're trying the impossible task of moving back back to Athens, which they can't do, yeah. Yeah. they should continue to produce yeah. and let Athens take the surplus. Yeah. So they, it wouldn't turn into a yeah. like we'll the get, we'll get there. Again. We'll get there. Oh, okay. uh, and I have even you know a case of what I call Imperial Republic that I oh. think fits yeah. nice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Athens, but let me, at this point, the only thing I want to do is I want to explore, uh, without a state, 
you know, it's just uh, naked individuals without anything. Um, at what, under what conditions will they be interested in just producing? And after that, I'll show that this breaks down pretty quickly, and then this leads to this, all these interesting stuff, back things and problems and all these things. Okay. So, so again, you know, the, the player I is going to choose producing if producing is better than looting the first time and then knowing that they are going to be all the time fighting with each other. When you rearrange these, basically, this is telling us that I is going to choose uh, production if what if A, so the uh, ratio of the uh, um, technology or technological whatever of uh, I is more than the discount uh, factor times one minus one over the efficiency of, of looting. So basically, the better he is in terms of um, you know technology or the more productive, the more interested in peace, and the more efficient, and sorry, and the less efficient in terms of looting, also the more interested uh, I is going to be in, uh, in, in production. Okay? It's not very, you know, it's nothing spectacular here. Uh, we can do the same thing for player one, sorry, player J. Player J will choose production if producing all the time is better than Loot, you know, producing some looting, taking advantage of I, who is producing, and but no, then knowing that he's going to be, they are all going to be in a looting situation all the time, right? You rearrange these, and it's telling us that J is going to uh, prefer producing if one over the technology of I is better than basically uh, some. Uh, some function of the uh, the uh, technology of looting. Let's you know. Let's put together these two things: the uh, conditions under which um, I is going to uh, be interested in producing, and the conditions under which J is interested in producing. Here, and what we get basically is just reverse this relationship. We get that um, this is the condition of J being interested in producing, and this is the condition of I being interested in producing. Right? So it means that A, the ratio of the productivity of I and J, has to be bounded by some values, right? which I think basically gives us the solution that A has to be, cannot be too large or too small. right? If A is very, very big, if it, could, it approaches infinity, um, this inequality is not going to hold. J always will have an interest in looting, going for looting. Okay? In the same way, if A is very, very small and approaches zero, this condition will not hold either. I will always have an interest in, uh, in looting. Right? So it has to be that for particular values of the discount rate and the technology of looting, A has to be somewhat bounded. So cooperation, this is telling us, can only happen when you have pretty equal societies. When you have, and I'm using all the time income, but of course if I knew how to do this, it could be other things, other types of preferences. And if you are very unequal, then everything explodes. Because the one, at least according to this, the one that has pretty bad technology production always is always interested in grabbing the things of the other and making the life of the other impossible and therefore impossible. Right? So, you know, just a point of information. So where is the translation between income on one hand and then the two variables here, which are the capacity to loot and the capacity to produce? They yeah. seem like quite different. Well, uh, so this is, I haven't said anything about A, and I'll, so the you know, capacity of produce that then leads to income, right? The difference is income. And, I, and so here there are only two things, basically, apart from the discount rate. One is the capacity to produce, so your income, 
and then there is this efficiency yeah, parameter of yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. At this time, and throughout the paper, as you will see, I have not really made. So I, I'm, not, I'm not putting the two of them together. So I'm not making the zeta func uh, a function of a or something like that. Okay. I'm struggling with that. Uh, the thing is that if I do that, then I'm going to, and I don't want to do that for. If I do that, you know, if if the efficiency with which I look, yeah, is uh, is a function of of my other my technology production in, on the other dimension, just the economic one, then I'm going to, the result I'm going to get is that those that are good at one thing are going to do the other right, thing, right, and so. Right. But I think that's not how things work, and I'll, I'll try to defend. But so, in other words, you don't think that those who are efficient at production would also tend to be efficient at looping. Uh, they will be efficient at, at defense. They may, may not. I don't know. I want to make that. Um, Leave it open for now. Yeah. Yeah. I'll show, you know, I. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. so uh, you know, under conditions of equality, you can have peace without binding institution. Okay? You can have peace without. It's not that you always have, there can be collapses. Discount rates can vary, all sorts of things can happen, but you don't need to have any type of a state. That's where you have peace. Okay, so um, Hobbes was wrong, and I think Rousseau was wrong, so I'm not sure why I'm saying Hobbes is here. Right. Well, I mean, he's wrong in the sense that you're assuming. He, Hobbes' assumption is that theta is very high, right? Is well, that he doesn't. People well, are very, he, that anyone can right. dominate anyone else. Because That's there is the, always these. Uh, so, yep. You know this push for uh, you know grabbing things or you know this this acquisition or acquisition. Like, Everybody thing. in principle, anyone in principle has yeah, we are the capacity yeah. to dominate anyone yeah. else well, and the willingness to do so. Yeah. Right? but I'm kind of and you're saying the let's let that vary yeah. and see what happens. Uh, but it's, you know, yeah. I, but I'm trying to say well, since there are costs to that, the if you cannot grab too much, then you are in the state yeah. of the case. Okay. Uh, so, and in a way, you know, this corresponds to, I would say, pre-political societies. So they are basically pretty small. Uh, they are equal, except for, um, again, consumption of, you know, polygamous uh, practices mostly. Uh, there is no institutionalized power. So our thing, you know, when you look at uh, things like just uh, clusters, uh, um, analysis of the, um, of these, uh, People in the in uh, the Yaches in uh, in Paraguay. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful book that I recommend with lots of surprises at the end uh, of the book and written in French tradition. Uh, so, which sometimes is good, not always. Most of the time, it's not. But uh, <laughs> you can see that these leaders are not uh, uh, political leaders. They are cajoling. They are negotiating. They are bargaining. We know from a study by uh, an economist, Sam Bowles, and with some anthropologists, that the, um, the, uh, the correlation of uh, wealth between parents and children in pre-agrarian societies is very low. Okay? So where, whereas it goes up very quickly, this, that correlation for um, pastoral and agrarian societies. Uh, the same thing for the, uh, for the uh, Kung people. Uh, and so on. Okay. Excuse me, are you saying that you can have a food in a society that is also equal? No, no, no. I'm saying, saying that, I'm saying that when we look at measures of income and uh, wealth, except for polygamous practices, those societies are very equal. But isn't but, that a big but? Except, I mean, that's well, what that's why I everything? explain, that's why I explain it, that there is this inequality. Um, having said that, this is an inequality that is not, does not move onward. It's not passed from generation to generation. We have more kids. That's true. You have and more you children. More accumulation because you have more, um, yes. you know, slave labor. Being no, it's not the slave labor. You have. That's an interesting point. You know, I'm not a specialist on these societies. What you have is. Uh, you know, I, I'm thinking of here about work on the Yanomamos, mostly uh, uh, by Chanyon, 
uh, these tribes in, uh, in uh, the border of Venezuela and uh, Brazil, um, what you have is uh, certain types of individuals are rewarded uh, with uh, more or get more women basically. They have more children, but it's also true that, and this is also a strategy of accumulating power, but these societies break down very easily. There are lots of processes of fission all the time. And so um, they have this kind of, say, carrying capacity, and at one point everything floats and they, they leave and so on. Okay. So, so, um, so then, um, you know, um, having shown that, or you know, trying to put some uh, analytical structure to this intuition that you can have cooperation and at the same time no institutions and some inequal some equality, um, if you have what I call a bias technological shock, or the age group called bias technological shock, something that leads someone to get more productive than other the other part. What we're going to see is the generation of inequality, uh, by definition. Um, this is going to sort individuals basically into producers and looters, right? Because the I say are the ones that experience a higher A and a higher technology, technological uh, advantage or income advantage. Um, the A uh, goes up. They still have an interest in producing and peace, but the others have an interest in looting. And this is going to lead uh, uh, to systematic conflict over the, uh, the appropriation of the productivity gains. Right? Um, the kind of technological shock I'm thinking about here is one that, precisely because there is no state, it has to be something that you can um, enjoy uh, without the, any need to have the protection of the state. Right? We many, many times we talk in. in all of the external institutional economics about the patent system and how the state uh, protects uh, inventors and so on and so forth. Uh, my idea is even more simpler. Simple. Uh, think of something that changes the use we make of land in such a way that land that was everywhere the same, had the same value, now in some places becomes better, more productive than others. Right? So imagine the world was a hunting place someone invents something called domestication of plants, in some places those plants are going to, it is possible to, uh, to uh, use them, but in others, even if you have that technology, even if it is available to everyone, in other places you cannot because the climate is bad and so on, right? So land itself, because it's different, even if everybody knows how to grow wine, well, you do not get the same kinds of wine in California and Catalonia, right? They are different, or, you know, for the matter of Sahara. So, but, uh, I'm sorry, so the, the, um, the, the, when you say the technological shock is biased, you're saying it's biased towards I or J. Exactly. So but don't they, in ha I mean, they're not, one, I is not in Catalonia and J is not in California. They're both in Catalonia or California, or might be some Well, it, it could be anything. I'm not, in fact, uh -huh. in fact, it could be, uh, they could be territorially uh, separated, or they can be living in the same place. With, I mean, everybody lives in. I mean, there is something, some spatial separation between. You're positing all of that us. there's always going to be some kind of, of technological shock that could bias one group. Yes, and I'll show that this okay. is indeed the case. Okay. In the empirical part. Okay. Um, and so this is what then leads to conflict, and but then. Precisely that type of conflict is what opens the way to the construction of political institutions. Not always, and if it doesn't, I don't know exactly why, so don't ask me about this, um, then you don't have, uh, you know, it's kind of looting all the time. But if there are, then I think that we can think of, of that as the moment where the political institutions are established. Um, the first one is going to be, the first, and there are two solutions, right? The Olsonian one, where the looters have an incentive to restrain themselves in exchange for some kind of transfer that the producers are making to the, the potential looters. And they are giving them a constant part of their production in exchange for not being looted completely, you know, 100%. The other solution, which I think is not, has not been explored by the literature, is that the producer themselves, producers themselves invest or 
spend some of their time producing or generating some defense technology that allows them to defend themselves against the looters, right? And again, you know, this would apply to, well, I think this is not very nice, external versus internal, it means to more or less separation spatial. Um, so very quickly on these, because we don't have that time and it's uh, not really very important. So basically, um, what we, you know, I'm trying to show in the paper is that you can have either monarchical settlement or a republican one. In the monarchical one, the agent I is going to make some payment to the looter, then the looter J gets <coughs> some payoff, and there are some there is some space under which both of the looters and the producers have an interest in coordinating on a monarchical settlement. Similarly, there is a set of conditions under which the producers, if they go for a Republican settlement, they have, they get something and it's related to the productivity and what I call a defensive parameter. This means that the Jays are not going to be able to loot them, so they simply stay producing. And so there is a space under which a Republican settlement is visible, okay? Um, and given all these things, and just to intuitive, since we want to go into perhaps empirics, um, basically, in the under the conditions in which you can have feasible political institutions, um, basically the uh, producers are going to choose um, a republican settlement if the the, can, the, the quantity they have to pay is bigger than lambda divided by their technology parameter. So it really depends then, just the idea here is that the solution monarchy or republic is going to depend basically on the extraction capacity of the looters and the defense technology of the uh, producers. Um, when I say republican, this doesn't mean people that go and vote, and they vote to uh, to hire someone. Because if they hire someone, that someone cannot credibly commit not to be a monarch. So I'm thinking about the republic as a place where those that are in, a, in the republican settlement themselves defend, organize their defense, right? They cannot subcontract defense because, and that's, for example, the big problem of Italian cities in the 16th century, 15th century, when they hired condottieri, at the end the condottiero ended up taking over uh, the city, right? This is the case with the Sforza and Milan, and that's why the Ven in Venice they went through so many very complicated institutions to make sure that they could um, govern themselves and without having to resort to external um, external uh, uh, soldiers or captain, right? Um, let me just, uh, I found this, I'm reading a bit on now on war and war technologies. This is a, a book by Keegan, a, a British military historian, and he talks about, so the, it's very much about this question of where does this, why is that the production and the defense technology uh, are not completely correlated. And I found this, and I, since I knew that you were going to ask, <laughs> just type this uh, very quickly yesterday. Uh, it's true, I typed it yesterday. Uh, so, um, and you know, he says, well, why is that at one point in the, uh, the end of the second millennium before Christ, you have these invasions from the steppes into Mesopotamia and so on? said, well, that's because the chariots were introduced and horses were, for the first time, used. Um, it took a long time to domesticate horses, and it was only when they were, well, you know, they had the, the proper size and everything that, where you could, it turns out, the soldier, the, 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 the horseman can ride the horse in the front of a horse, otherwise it's very difficult to control a horse, and this took a while. Anyway. So he says, you know, the infinity of time the step normal spent herding and guarding livestock, which kept him in the saddle but not otherwise occupied, meant many constant archery practice economic sense. So it's not so you have very productive societies in Mesopotamia, agriculturally advanced and 
certainly technologically and in all senses, the, all the archaeological remains we have seem to show that they were richer. But then you have these guys that just in producing something that uh, didn't make them that, uh, that wealthy, that though had these unintended or secondary consequences in terms of military technologies so that they could go circling at distance of 100 and 200 yards from the herds of an armored foot soldiers, a chariot crew, two people, could kill six men a minute, right? So it means that in 10 minutes, if you had uh, 10 uh, chariots, um, and it's not uh, then, but 10, uh, would cause about 500 casual casualties or more. So there's this shift in technology, and this is one of the big moments in change in, in history in the, in the, in the Middle East. Right? Uh, just let me add that if for some reason the military parameter of I becomes so efficient that the extra cost of attacking is lower than what you get from looting J, you go from just defending yourself against looters to just doing what you said. You go and kind of hang on uh, okay. um, so, uh, you know, for, of course, you have to, you have to ask something already, but others want to ask. So, you know, they, let me move into the empirics, uh, which I'm still constructing. And the first, so basically what I want to show more or less is that you have equal societies, or uh, to me the technological shock is mostly agriculture, that agriculture comes, it's basically exogenous, a exogenous shock is not related to institutions. That's what triggered institution building and that the institutions depend on military technology. Right? So what I have been doing basically is that I have been following work by Hibbs and Olson, although they have done this at the country level, I have done it uh, by dividing the world in quadrants of 10 degrees latitude longitude. This gives me 234 quadrants in the world that have land, uh, about 30 are in Antarctica, so I'm so I'm, I'm screwing them in one of the tests. Okay. And now, uh, so that you do not get distracted by the numbers. So basically, the, the debates about the agriculture are very long, and there are lots of different theories about why uh, there was a transition to agriculture. Some say it was culture, that there was a shift in, in conceptions uh, in, among human beings. Um, that's the latest, and so I suppose uh, more postmodern one. Um, but then there are these stories about changes in climate, about um, about uh, changes in popu population growth that leads to Malthusian constraints and forces people to invent. Uh, then there are those that say it's just about learning, it's the process of learning. But you know, it doesn't really matter to me which one of them it is. It could be any of them. What is certain is that. In any case, agriculture can only appear in those places where you have the conditions to have agriculture, right? In Antarctica, it's not going to appear, but in other places it will. And mostly taking work by Jared Diamond, what I look is at the impact of a set of variables on uh, that are basically climate. Climate theory is, uh, goes from one to four, and it's types of climate from the worst type the best type in terms of, of growing plants and, and domesticating animals it's taken from the Koppel's classification of climate areas in the, in the world. Latitude, the square of latitude to get some sort of um, uh, discontinuous effect of latitude. Then uh, following Diamond, what is the, the ratio of the east-west axis to the north-south axis in the continent? The idea being that the, the uh, the longer the east-west axis, uh, the diffusion of agriculture becomes faster because when you domesticate a plant in a particular latitude, it kind of spreads very quickly <coughs> at the same latitude, but it takes longer to move north or south because you have to adapt that domestic plant. And then whether there is a barrier, sea barrier or not, like if you have to cross the sea, it takes longer. Right? And so what I do is I look at, for these places I have coded, um, well, uh, there, there are data on animals and plants 
of uh, domesticated animals and plants, uh, but probably what I want you to focus on is, and it, it works well for all the species <coughs> things, but this is your story culture, the first place to, or the, the first moment where a culture was possible was at the end of the Holocene period, 9,500 9, years BC, and this is how long it took to get to agriculture. Basically, the, uh, the, the uh, it was, you know, the, the better the climate, the, uh, the faster the transition to agriculture, so the sooner it got uh, a negative sign means you're getting to, to, to agriculture faster. Um, latitude has also a positive impact. Um, the axis of the continent has very big impact on islands, so being in Australia, even if all the other conditions were pretty good, um, it took a longer time to get agriculture. I'm sorry, do you mind if I... Yeah, yeah, so the individual observation here is this uh, artificial yes, unit. Yes. That you, and how do you have the data on the years to agriculture in each of these units? Where does that come from? Um, well, basically it's a lot is about archaeological uh, archaeological data, right? So we have, uh, or they have some different books or different people, and because I have consulted, has been all this work about the, the, the the evidence we have of types of plants that are of a domesticated or a you know, uh, type, and I'm using that. that oh, do we have, is that data that fine grained though? I mean, uh, it's usually like some, in Egypt they got agriculture. For right? some continents, it is pretty. It, for some continents, it is pretty fine grained. So, for example, for Europe and the Near East, we have lots of of. Um, of data points, and some people have built these algorithms to to to, to calculate them, uh, you know, to kind of extrapolate from those things. In, in East Asia too, it is pretty good. For other places, it is more difficult. And yeah, so there is error in certainly in measurement, and there is also dispute, for example, for Latin America, different types of some classify agriculture as coming first than others because they. They measure it by types of seeds that some do not consider to be them to be uh, domesticated. So there is some dispute, but but there is uh, there is. Because uh, you could dispute. imagine some of that extrapolated data would be generated with exactly this kind of model. Right? No, it is not. The, it's not. Okay. It is not. Okay. No, it's excuse, not. Me. I, 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 excuse me. What's the unit of measurement here in this table? The, it is the as I said, it is the, the square. Uh, so I divide the world in uh, in by by quadrants of 10 degrees latitude and longitude, right? Mm -hmm. So, for example, take uh, take the uh, the equator, although it's not the best. Crossing Greenwich, it's not the best because it's the sea. But the, all the quadrant 10 degrees to the uh, to the west, mm -hmm. to the east, and to the north, that would be one quadrant. And then the next 10 degrees to the north would be the second quadrant and so on and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm coding those that have land at the, uh, at the center or that they have more than 50% of land. It's a pity there is no blackboard here. Uh, but is that? Yeah. Yeah. So, so basically, just to show more or less, this is this is uh, a, um, an index of, an average index of climate latitude, the axis of continental land. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm averaging, giving the same weight to each one of them. This is just a, for the purposes of showing more or less how it works. This is years to introduction of our culture, and each one of these points is one of the quadrants. I have used the um, abbreviation of the current country in that quadrant, so that people know, because if I use my Codification it would be 40, 10, 85, or 6,030, whatever. I don't know. You know. And here, so there are many Russias, for example. There are many oh, that right. are here. Uh, you know, Chinas. There are several Chinas. You know, big countries get many quadrants. Okay. Um, but the point of this is to show to you that um, that as biographical conditions are better in terms of this average. 
the years it took to move to agriculture uh, basically, you know, kind of were very, very uh, kind of zero since the moment the climate changed and allowed the uh, you know, humankind to move to agriculture. Mm -hmm. For those places that are pretty bad, either because they are islands or because they are in ice, uh, you know, all the time under ice and so on, then agriculture never happens. Right? So Antarctica is not on this. Antarctica is not here. I right. Think. Right. I think because it would just be it would be infinite value yeah. here. Yeah. In well, what I do is that I code uh, places that do not have agriculture as 2000. So I code. I, I start coding. So. You know, I take one pattern and I look at when did agriculture appear. So if it appeared in 1000 BC, it's minus 1000. If it has not appeared yet, it's 2000. Right? But then since I subtract uh, years to introduction of agriculture, from the moment it, it was possible to have, then it would be 11,500. Yeah? Yeah. This is not very confusing. Okay, so that's the first step. So agriculture, to me, seems that most of it is explained exogenously. It leads to this uh, shock that makes all these uh, countries, uh, I mean, sorry, territories uh, diverge in, in fortunes, just in a combination of geographical factors. And to me, this is where state formation should happen too, that in those places that moved first to agriculture, those are the ones that progressively move to a state. Now, our data on state formation is bad, and in the sense that, you know, my argument is very stylized and very theoretical, and it's just about the formation of coercive institutions. Um, and it could be that coercive institutions just means 500 people together with a board or with whatever, right? Um, our information about the state formation is comes from basically archaeological data that is based on writing material. And writing material happened much later. So it took about 5,000 years from the first the emergence of the Cold War, the, the appearance of domesticated plants to have writing. Right? So, but it's still, my claim is that um, even if that's the case, in those places where we first show, see records that indicate States, that has to be related with the agricultural shock. Okay? To measure state formation, I use the same type of observation, and I look mostly at writing records that tells us that tell us that indeed there was political authority, or um, the existence of fortifications or structures that indicate that there was indeed some strong political structure of a defensive or a, or an offensive nature. Um, and so I look at uh, how is the emergence of the state uh, explained by, again, a set of parameters that I use for agriculture, and then uh, the relationship between when the state emerged and the year of transition to agriculture. Okay? And again, the state is very is well explained by climate. The better the climate, the uh, faster the the, uh, the sooner the state appear. Um, the axis also has an effect, and have being an island or not, that's too. Uh, this is the years of transition to agriculture. So the sooner you have a transition to agriculture, the uh, the sooner you have a state. So, so the dependent variable is used to the emergence of a state? Uh, in this case, is when did the state appear. Okay. Yeah. And uh, since the states can happen, what I would say, originally, so they appear, or they can be just be imposed by someone from outside, in these four models, I'm just looking at, I'm sorry, in these four models, I'm looking at both the formation of the state as an original thing or as in position from a foreign power, right? Um, and here I'm just looking at the emergence of the state for those cases where it seems it was an original, endogenous uh, thing, right? And the relationship uh, 
keep, you know, continues to hold well, although the observations fall to 46 because that's all the quadrants for which I think, coding them, I can say that those were places where a state appeared originally, endogenously. Okay. And so <coughs> years of transition to agriculture <coughs> does pretty much all the explaining when you, yes. but that's why. Yes, the, yeah. Uh, yeah, it is very robust. Yeah, yeah. Yes. You know, this is, this is the relationship, this is the right. approximate transition to our culture, and this is the year of emergence of the state. There is certainly a lot of, you know, a period for which we do not know anything. Uh, and then, but then the rest, you know, as the first form, the others so do. So it much. looks like, you know, a lack of 5,000 years. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm being conservative here because we know, for example, that before writing, there were fortifications like the Jericho one, pretty big and it points to state institutions and it was it appeared here. We have clusters of we have populations clustered in villages in the Palestine area for uh, of about six thousand, seven thousand years BC and it all looks as if it was a political community given how they are constructed, fortified and everything. But you know I have gone from the the kind of uh, you know conservative coding. Um, again, this is the quadrant, but I'm using the name of the country that falls in the middle of the quadrant, right? So Iraq, Syria, Iran, and so on. Egypt here to the capital. We must be exhausted, and I should be kind of. But I promised <laughs> the bone thing, right? And uh, till what time do I have? Five thirty, but that, but we should but have some time for yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, very quickly, this is the part I'm, I'm kind of. The others are, you know, okay. <laughs> this is just. All. Uh, but my point is that shifting military technology should change the balance of power on the political institutions, and indeed, it seems as if all these big, um, you know, big shocks led to rearrangements of political power. Um, bronze weapons led to more hierarchical societies. That's precisely what we saw in uh, the uh, in the graph, right? The cut -out, the cutoff point here is there was something certainly here, but you only see agglomerations of a certain kind after bronze weapons were invented. As I said, two wheeled chariots led to this uh, entry of all these peoples from the steppes, the Hyksos, and so on and so forth. Um, lead to federalization uh, around 1800. Aristotle, a good empiricist, empiricist, talks about the relationship between types of weapons and types of regimes, uh, cavalry very much related to oligarchy, uh, whereas democracy was about infantry and light armor and so on. Um, the feudalism of the, uh, of the um, European feudalism was certainly, I think, related to the stirrup, invention of the stirrup, and you know, I mean, kind of, again, you know, it's kind of uh, just in, I have to work on this. Um, more geographical barriers should lead to more, more self-government because it makes it easier for these small communities to defend themselves. This may be why also Greece had more city-states, given the geographical structure of the country, the valleys, and so on, perhaps. Um, and then, you know, the fact that you have lots of bandits or lots of... Uh, Looters competing should lead perhaps to more leeway for city state formation. So that's why God talks about in a book on cities that city states seem to, all of them historically, have formed in marginal er er areas of empires. And perhaps this explains why the Flemish Italian urban axis appeared in the Lotharingia, which was the place in the middle of the Carolingian Empire that basically collapsed when it was when the Carolingian Empire was um, uh, split among different, the, the three uh, children, uh, the, the, the Lothar was the one that was unable to control the area, and so those, that's why the cities appear. Anyway, um, as I said, uh, each type of political settlement will be associated with different levels of inequality, but in interaction with the technological shock, right? So, uh, very quickly, uh, so, this is just a simulation with the parameters I showed. You'll take it for granted. This is, uh, imagine that the population is divided in these tiles. 
and this is per capita income for each decile, and uh, there is an income shock uh, without, so there is an income shock, the blue line, such that the first decile doesn't improve in anything, the others improve, and they improve uh, progressively from the second to the 10 decile, but still, the difference between this and the, the second decile and the 10 decile is such that it's, they can cooperate among, among, it, among amongst each other because they, it's a bounded, they still are in the bounded condition I talked about at the beginning. Um, if they establish a republic of the defensive type, they have to pay some tax. These guys do not change because they are outside the republic. They are the ones that want to loot. These are the ones that are in the republic. They pay a tax, which means that all of them uh, lose some income paying the tax to defend themselves against the looters, okay? If there is a republic, imperial republic, the imperial republic basically consists on those that are in the republic, the rich ones that can still cooperate, invading the first decile and grabbing everything. And it's, you know, it's nice because they get back what they would lose, okay? Whereas if for some reason, for, you know, given the, the defense technology, the poor have very good weapons, they, they are horsemen and so on, and they establish a monarchy, they extract a lot of resources from these, and so they get a lot of income, and the others experience an or, enormous loss of income, right? So we can, but it's not just the political <coughs> system, and it's not just the economic shock, it's the interaction of the two. Okay, so uh, that's where the bones thing comes in, that because the standard measures are difficult to get, and because it looks like human height is not just an, related to genetic factors, but perhaps to, uh, no, sorry, but it's related also to nutrition during the uh, childhood and adolescence, um, then one can think of this as pointing to differences in welfare, uh, right? So I'm taking data from Fogel, the Chicago economic historian. He has calculated that in England, for example, in 1790, the top decile consume about 4,000 calories per day. Uh, the bottom decile consume about 1,500, um, which meant basically that they didn't work at all. They couldn't they work like one, two, three hours, but not more than that. So there was a lot of, looks like, differences. With Francis, we collected two types of measures direct measurements of living individuals, um, censuses and conscription records that are taunts. We haven't done much work on that. We got this uh, data set on 16,000 Native Americans in 1890. Boss got money from the federal government uh, to go and measure everyone. They were very interested in cranial measurements, but they also got the height and so on. So we use this. And then we have a skeletal remains, either complete or ephemera. The ephemera are difficult are problematic because you have to extrapolate using mostly um, functional forms developed by the army, the American army for the Korean War. And um, Asian Americans, uh, African Americans and white have very different ratios of femur to height. Okay, so the extrapolation is kind of uh, dangerous. Again, you know, to show that somehow income and, and height are related. This is data for Holland from the year 1000 till 1800. This is the average males. This is in centimeters. Uh, there was a big, a, a small uh, decline. It seems to be normal with industrialization. A lot of people moved to cities. Cities were extremely unhealthy places. Uh, for delete, sorry, even for infant, infant mortality rates, for example, where like twice in some cities, twice the infant morta mortality rates, child mortality rates of rural areas. But then after a while, when things get good, um, then you have this big increase in height for the Dutch population, so that the average man in, in the Netherlands is about 184, 184 Why centimeters. Why are the high SES females lower than the average SES females? Blue. Blue is high SES. Blue squares is high SES females, right? 
Yeah. And the red squares are, I don't know. are uh, average SEs. No, no, this is high. Oh, yeah, you're right. Wouldn't, they you know, be, wouldn't you expect there must them to be, be high? There must be. This is just, you know, I, I kind of pasted it from a, I copied and pasted it from a, an article right. I, I didn't check. It just check. seems strange that they would be yeah, lower you're than you're right. That. There must oh, be no some mistake here. Yeah. 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 Okay, anyway. Well, anyway, you know. But it's, it's it's different data, sort of, right? So it sounds like, for example, yeah, but it, you don't it's have the same data. So I, it, it, where's the high SES women, uh, low SES women in that pe here. period for which you have? Oh, right. You, there is you don't have it, oh, yeah, so yeah, who knows? Yeah, who knows? Well, no. Let's move on. But you're piecing together yeah, different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, this is how, this we is know how. we know that this is true. Yeah, this is, yeah, I mean, this is the you don't even need that graph. We know that someone got the Guinness record and. He is the tallest right. man on earth at this point, <laughs> and this is an average. Yeah. In the U.S., the height's been going down think, since we've yes, had inequality exactly. and so forth. Yeah. This, so is, that, that, this that, is a well-known no, fact. It is true, though, that I want to show this because I love this graph. This is uh, from Angus Deaton at Princeton. He, you know, basically a lot of the data has, done, has been done with cross-country analysis showing that GDP is positively related to height. The Western world is not here, but should appear like here. If you take Africa out, which is what a lot of the studies have done, then it shows as if you have more income, you become taller. When you throw in Africa, the blue dots, then everything becomes a mess. So I think that one has to be careful and has to do, this is, Africa is the blue, this is, uh, you know, Central Asia, this is Latin America, South Asia, this is Haiti. Uh, one has to be very careful, and so, uh, well, take all the data I'm going to show with a grain of salt, and we are trying to do analysis within groups, mm. right? okay? His, some uh, historical trends in height, uh, it looks as if there, has, there was a decline in height in the transition from hunting gathering societies to agricultural <laughs> societies, although the fact is that when you look at hunting gathering societies today, they are not that, they are in fact uh, shorter. Uh, um, this, this is the early bronze. This is uh, uh, in Greece. Uh, men and women, uh, common people, and these are uh, measurements from tombs in this Senate. So already we see that uh, royal uh, types were taller by about, you know, eight. Seven, eight centimeters. Of course, it can go the other way around, right? That tall people are the ones that win elections yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and become the kings and queens. Teaching but, yes. <laughs> well, that's why. <laughs> okay. So, the Boas data is very fascinating. It has, a, you know, as I said, 16,000 individuals um, measured in, uh, in many places at the end of the 19th century. These are the uh, coefficients of variation. Uh, for all these groups, uh, and then this is the height, the average height of these uh, communities, and this is the co coefficient of variation of the U.S. in 1977. My point, our point here being that about two thirds of these groups uh, were had lower levels of dispersion than um, than the U.S. in 1977. Mm -hmm. If you want to know the best predictor of height, not of the coefficient of variation, but of height, is distance to the, uh, to, I think it's uh, latitude 40. So as you go north, people become shorter. As you go south, they become shorter, right? The tallest oh. men on earth in the 19th century were the seal. Uh, they were taller than tall Europeans. Um, Who were they? The seal. The seal. The, the Sioux Indian. Indian. The Sioux, oh. sorry. The Sioux. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, some people say that was because they received a lot of beef from the federal <laughs> government because there were these contracts, but even if you control, you look at people that were born before those pacts were made, it looks as if they were still were pretty tall. This is a summary uh, of some cases I put in the front. Um, so basically, this is um, a bunch of uh, cases, not all of them, the ones that we have. These are pre-estate societies, but they still are agricultural. These are monarchical authoritarian and these are democratic agrarian, okay? And the point here is that the, in terms of agriculture, so it's not about industrial versus agricultural, but somehow agricultural societies, but with different institutions. Um, notice that 
in Egypt we have royal families. Uh, this is the, there is uh, all these mummies that uh, were x-rayed and adjusting for shrinkage of the mummy, which is about six to eight centimeters, <laughs> they look as 174 males. Uh, he made, you know, very tall, but the thing is that, which I surprises me, but the thing is that when I, uh, yesterday or a few days ago, I was looking at more data mummies, and some were very tall. I, I, in any case, for the same period, uh, this is a 19th, 20th century uh, dynasty, 166 the commoner, so eight, about eight centimeters. Uh, yeah, I'll talk about this in a, For Poland, we got about 4,000 uh, people from cemeteries. Uh, interestingly, in Poland, uh, there were four types of cemeteries, noble cemeteries, rural, non-Jewish, Jewish, and urban. And these data, not this one, but the data we have spans from like 11th century to 18th century, um, consistently di different with variations that um, that also interesting. But the difference between a Jewish at that time, the poorest in society, and the noble about almost eight centimeters, okay? Compared to this to Ohio, in Ohio, uh, recruits in the National Guard, mid 19th century. Um, these are the uh, um, occupations. Uh, the the uh, difference is only two centimeters. Okay. So you don't have pre agricultural societies. Of course, you can't tell um, who's noble and who's not noble since no. you don't have nobles. No. And no but you could take you could take the tallest versus the smallest. Yeah. The thing is that there are also lots of. Uh, you know, there's a lot of dispersion. Uh, in, uh, in, 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 in. So you can, that's why I'm using coefficients of variation, because if I take the extremes, you can have a very tall and very short. And then the thing is that I we have been I have been looking for data on Australia, uh, Australian Aborigines because Australian some Australian people some Australian uh, anthropologists measured a lot of Aborigines or not a lot but some of them in the 1930s and 20s. But it turns out it's a mess because they come from very different ethnic backgrounds. You have very tall, very short, and it's So it's I wonder if you, could, if you could look at the Native Americans um, controlling for um, longitude, uh, controlling for latitude, whether you could look at those who were, because in the 19th century there were actually still some who were somewhat more hunter gatherer -y. Yeah. very egalitarian yeah. um, political structures, yeah. and others that had yeah. much more um, inegalitarian political structures. We started doing this work, and we stopped. I, I think I have to go back to this. Uh, well, you know, lots of, you know, these are uh, kernel densities. Um, let me show to you. This is the Austria-Hungary and Germany at the end of the 18th century. Peasants, German peasants versus, uh, sorry, uh, versus the aristocrats, you know, so at age 17, so maturation may matter, but for age 18, you know, there are interesting differences here. Um, if you, yeah. if you identify democracy with low uh, inequality of height using Ohio, uh, but I would be willing to bet that if you use the Philippines and India, that you would get an even large uh, uh, here, Philippines and India with today. Uh, or, or, for the democratic period. With Taiwan and South Korea, similar levels of development. And you find, you find the absolute reverse correlation. So I, I think you've got to, I, I think you have to be very careful about the association of the yeah. democracy with. That's why I stopped doing this for a few years, <laughs> but uh, it has become uh, more interesting to me again. Because you, have you don't have any one group that you can trace from a non-democratic period to a democratic period where you can you know, control for all of these you know, genetic factors and things like that. It's a good point. It's, it's different. Is it the Netherlands? Does it, yeah, yeah. The Netherlands? No, yeah, it's uh, somebody in Europe. A lot is very, you know, uh, driven by income. No, I think you're right. I mean, we haven't done any work on the last 200 years. I mean, most of the data is there. It's just that I'm so attracted to the pre modern yeah. data. This is just to show to you the current densities of the slave economies. These are Charleston elites, men. These are 
slaves, and these are free black. Uh, there is a movement uh, up, uh, in males, in women, no change happens, right? These are white women, and these are slaves versus free women. So, the future, you know, let me finish here to make some sort of prediction. So, this is from Hawking. He says, there is no time to wait for the Armenian evolution to make us more intelligent and better natured, but we are now entering a new phase of what might be called self-design evolution, and in which we will be able to change and improve our DNA. And so he goes right to the point, right? His laws will be passed, da da da, to prove that we cannot resist the temptation, so superhumans will appear. There are going to be major political problems, you know, so there's a political economy modeling here, <laughs> with the unimproved humans, meaning us, who won't be able to compete. Presumably they will be, the, the unimproved ones will die out or become unimportant. Instead, there will be a race of self-designing beings who are improving themselves at an ever increasing rate. So I went to California to see if I could find this uh, new, Dang, and <laughs> <laughs> he's pretty short, though. <laughs>